Okay, we're at lesson eight. So the information for this chapter, uh, the primary source of information for this chapter is coming from a book called Anger Management, How to Take Control of Your Anger and Develop Self-Control and Live a Happier Life. And the author was Bill Andrews. I really recommend that book. Very good book. And uh, it covers a lot of ground. Anyway, um, this is our... Uh, section eight of the online anger management course. And uh, we're going to cover a few different things. All right. So I'll just get started. In this section, we'll take a look at three powerful ways to speed up the process of healing from anger, practicing forgiveness of others, hurtful behavior, nurturing self-respect, and writing about situations that provoke anger and other painful emotions. And the first thing we're going to get to is practicing forgiveness. Now, um, one of the things that I'll start off by saying when we talk about uh, the topic of forgiveness, and I probably uh, mentioned it in some earlier lessons, is that when we forgive someone, the forgiveness is not necessarily for them. It's for us. Right. It does something for us, regardless of what's going on with the other person because holding resentments against them ends up only hurting us and uh, causing problems in our own life as well as contributing uh, to our anger. When you hold it, when you hold on to past hurt, you're actually trying to relieve your pain by putting other people down and building yourself up. You may imagine that nursing old wounds is a way to control and prevent the humiliating exposure of your imperfections. You may even entertain vengeful fantasies of finally achieving fairness by hurting the people who hurt you. But instead of trying to control or redeem a hurtful situation, you can focus on managing your reaction to it. And this is actually the better option because again, um, a lot of us, would like to get revenge for different things that happen uh, with us, that happen in our life, uh, different people that we're dealing with or whatever, but um, it's not helpful, right? And in most cases, right, and especially if we've had a history of handling our anger badly, um, it's going to be worse for us. It's just going to aggravate our situation and, and not going to bring any benefit. One of the best ways to heal from anger is to forgive the people who hurt you. The act of forgiveness gives you new options for living your life on a much more realistic basis. Besides, if you don't forgive old wounds, they'll stay deep inside you forever. Is that what <clears throat> is that what you want? So, again, um, a lot of people or a lot of us, right, because I'm included in this group because I've had to work on my anger and which is what brought me to get into uh, even facilitating anger management groups, right? Um, a lot of us will choose to hold on to things that people did to us in the past and we don't want to let those things go, you know, and maybe there are some really serious things and we have reason for not wanting to let them go. But whatever our reason is, it would be better for us if we're able to Forgive the people and let the situation go. Now, the thing about forgiveness, it doesn't mean that you are condoning, approving of, or any way saying that it's okay what the person has done, right? Um, you're still you're still against it. You don't uh, agree with it or condone or approve of it, but you are letting it go to the effect that you're not going to continue to give it real estate in your brain and have you constantly uh, feeling, holding resentments or even fantasizing about uh, vengeful acts that you would like to take against a person. Forgiveness have nothing to do with condoning or excusing the wrongs that were done to you. It means letting go of those old wounds so you can move on with your life. And forgiveness has nothing to do with assessing the degree of the other people's guilt or the relative evil of their intentions. So again, 
um, regardless of what the person's intentions was and regardless of how severe the violation was, forgiveness is still the best option for us. Again, we're not condoning the behavior, nor are we excusing it. We're only um, freeing ourselves from uh, constantly carrying around this extra baggage. That's because forgiveness is not about other people at all. You forgive others for your own benefit, not theirs. The people who hurt you don't even have to know that you've forgiven their hurtful behavior. Your act of forgiveness is between you and yourself. It's no one else's business. In chapter, in an earlier uh, session, we looked at some ways uh, to foster forgiveness by not uh, taking others' wounding behavior personally, right? So that's definitely a thing we don't want to take. Most situations that happen with us or whether it's we, something we hear someone say or whatever, we don't want to take it personal. We want to find out a way to interpret it so that we're not taking the situation personal. But importantly, what it mentions here is the fact that the forgiveness is for us, right? The forgiveness, and I just tap my mic that's on my uh, chest, so I probably pounded in your ear right there. <laughs> Sometimes I forget that thing's on. Um, but the forgiveness is for us, and it's for us to be free to move on and to live our life. And as it mentioned here, it's not even necessary for you to even disclose to the person that you've even forgiven them. Right. And for some people that might sound contrary, but the thing is that I can forgive someone for something that they've done to me, but it doesn't mean that I have to choose to interact with that person any longer. Right. I already know what they're about and I know um, their intentions and I can choose not to engage with that person, but I'm still not holding the resentments towards them or I'm still not wishing uh, bad things to happen to them because I, uh, in, in my anger, you know, I would do all of that. You know, I would, um, and especially when I was, uh, younger and, and trying to really address my anger, um, I would have a lot of bad fantasies about the things that I would like to do to the people that I was angry with. And especially if you had done something to me, or I believed that you had done something to me. But that wasn't helpful for me or the other people, of course, but it wasn't helpful for me. And uh, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about how to um, being able to improve ourselves so that we're no longer getting in trouble and that we can live a better quality life. Because the thing we don't want to just survive life. We want to be able to thrive. Right. And we're not going to be able to do that if we're constantly dealing with these anger issues that are. Um, causing us to um, face uh, criminal charges and po possibly be incarcerated or lose jobs or being uh, discharged or kicked out of some other um, uh, organizations that we're trying to participate in. And we end up doing all of that when we fail to properly uh, manage our anger. So um, that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Right. So practicing forgiveness is the first uh, in this lesson, a thing that we want to do to help us to uh, manage our anger and to get rid of some of that emotional pain. Again, the forgiveness is for you, even though you're forgiving the other person, the forgiveness of you. And, and what it actually reminds me of is the, the concept. If you're um, part of, let's say, uh, substance abuse recovery, for example, um, you know, one of the steps. In the 12 step model of recovery, it talks about making amends to the people that you've harmed. Right. And again, the amends are for you. Right. You're making amends or you're apologizing or you're trying to set things straight with someone that you've harmed in the past. And just like forgiveness, you're doing it for you. Right. Because and one of the reasons that that's emphasized is because the people that we identify that we've harmed in the past. We may at one point have felt justified in the harm that we caused to them, 
because of whatever harm they caused to us, right? Tit for tat, right? Kill my dog, I kill your cat. Um, but that's not helpful, right? We don't want to go, we don't want to do an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth, right? Um, even though that's the way most of us have lived. Um, that's the way I lived. Matter of fact, um, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, for me, let's just say I would take it a step further, right? It wasn't an even straight across the board, uh, tit for tat. I would try to, uh, up at a level, whatever you did, I would up that. And, and that wasn't helpful for me. It caused a lot of problems in my life. Um, and if I, uh, continue to live that way, it'll continue to cause problems. And rather than, um, sitting here, trying to help you to manage your anger, I'll probably be back um, in, 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 in prison, incarcerated or something like that. So whether we are um, forgiving someone else or we're showing amends, making amends to someone that we've caused harm to, it is for us, it's for our own freedom uh, from the pain. And, and I wanted to mention the, the amends here, even though what I'm uh, coming from, you know, I've got some little notes that I'm coming from, uh, and it specifically talks about forgiveness and it doesn't mention the amends, but I wanted to throw that in because I, I think that is important. And I, I think it's equally important as the forgiveness, because if you have or do have anger issues, um, you like me probably have caused harm to other people, maybe a lot of harm. And it's a good idea to make amends for those things, right? Whether you feel justified or not, it is a good idea to make amends for the things that you have done to other people. Okay, the next one, nurturing self-respect. Okay, and <clears throat> before I get into that, um, the nurturing self-respect, the first thing comes to mind here is the topic of self-esteem. And I believe this is a very important topic for those of us who suffer from anger management issues and, and many other issues, even those who have, um, uh, let's say, involved with uh, substance abuse treatment, uh, for example, or um, other issues that we may to go get uh, professional help for therapy or what have you. We generally have uh, some self-esteem issues that we need to work on. And it's very important that we address those issues because it's going to be very difficult for us to have a whole lot of motivation if um, we have a low opinion of ourselves. And that's what self-esteem is, right? Self-esteem, how you esteem yourself or how you value yourself, right? So, um, and self-respect are one of the components. Um, one of the um, books that I use uh, when I teach self-esteem classes is a book called uh, six pillars of self-esteem. And what the book does is it, uh, describes self-esteem or it breaks it down in two primary components. Those components are self-efficacy and self-respect. The self-efficacy, uh, discusses your, um, uh, confidence and I describe it as your confidence in your competence, right? So confidence in your competence, basically meaning that you are confident that you are competent enough to navigate um, whatever you need to do in order to have a successful life. And the other component is self-respect, right? So it's your uh, belief in your right to be happy with the understanding that it's your responsibility, meaning your responsibility that you are happy, right? So whether you're happy, sad, or what have you, right? That's your responsibility. It's not going to come externally is something that we have to find within. So um, again, that's what this particular, uh, just the title of this section, that's what it reminds me of, nurturing self-respect. But anyway, um, when you're angry or facing antagonism from someone else, your most important resource is your self-respect. To respect yourself is to know that you are a worthwhile human being despite your mistakes. And that's the, uh, I'm going to actually stop and, and mention that, right? That you're a worthwhile human being despite your mistakes. So, um, if you are someone and there'll be different, uh, people, you'll be different people take the class, this particular class for different reasons. 
Some of you may take it because you've been pro or probation or court ordered to take an anger management class and you're taking a class. Some of us or some of you may be taking it because you realize like, hey, I have some anger management issues and 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 you try to work on self-development and figuring out the things that are going to help you and guide you towards being successful. Um, and so you're 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 taking a class. And for those of us who have had issues with the criminal justice system, a lot of times we will be embarrassed or uh, or, or feel shame associated with our history, with our past or our uh, criminal offenses. And, and that's the reason that I stopped here, because it says um, you may. Uh, uh, and talking about as far as being a worthwhile human being, despite your mistakes. So two things about that that I want to point out. One is I don't consider or call my past behavior uh, as it relates to my criminal activity and a lot of the bad decisions that I made uh, due to my anger. I don't call them mistakes. And I understand why a lot of people call them mistakes, but I don't call them mistakes because I think that's that that would give me in my brain give my brain the wrong message about what exactly that I did, right? Because um, if I uh, made a decision and I caused harm to someone, then that's not a mistake, right? That's a conscious decision. Uh, that's a conscious decision that I made to uh, take that action, right? However, I don't beat myself up over it. <clears throat> What's done is done and I can't undo it. So I move on. Right. And and I try to make amends. Right. Uh, I mentioned that uh, we're ended the forgiveness. Right. So I, I try to make amends for my actions, but I move on from there and I call my you know poor past uh, decisions exactly what they are. Poor decisions or or bad actions that I made. But I still believe that I'm a decent human being and I believe that all of you. Right. I don't even know you, but I believe that. All of us are inherently uh, decent human beings who have made uh, bad decisions throughout our lives. Right. And there's never going to come a time that um, that's not going to be the case. So it's not like I can go back in time and say, well, OK, um, I'm going to undo the bad things that I done that that doesn't happen. Right. Whatever is done is done. So I don't um, discard it. You know, I don't. Uh, minimize the things that I done. I take responsibility for them. But again, at the same time, I'm also not going to magnify them and constantly beat myself up over something that I can't do anything about at this time. But what I am doing is constantly um, doing things and making better decisions so that I don't repeat that behavior. And that is the point, right? So whether you're doing it through anger management or even people that uh, let's say people that uh, follow a, a, a particular uh, spiritual path or religious path. Right. And, and they operate and they use the the concept of repentance, let's say. Right. That's even one of the things about that. You know, when you do that turnaround with repentance, one of the, the things for it to be true or a lot of people say that qualifies it to be true. And I understand it's not a religious course, but. That, but they say that qualifies it to be true is that you don't return to the behavior and that's our objective. Right. So the objective is to um, become, uh, you know, decent human beings to get away from the, the bad things that we've done and to not repeat those behaviors. Right. So anyway. Um, says human beings are not perfect and perfection should never be expected of a human being. You can respect yourself regardless of what you're doing or what's going on in your life. That's because self-respect doesn't depend on getting what you want. A promotion at work, the ideal mate, a high, uh, a higher income or your ability to be perfect. Respecting yourself means accepting that you are unconditionally lovable no matter what anyone else says, right? So again, um, 
And when it's talking about this lovable, it don't necessarily mean that you're the, the you know, the most nicest and, 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 and not necessarily that everyone is going to approve of you, but you have to approve of you, right? You have to accept the fact that you're a decent human being, right? And not allow your uh, people to whoop you with your history, right? All men make mistakes. And this is men or women. Uh, Self-respecting people learn from theirs. You should learn. You should learn from yours too, because you can't prevent them. And and here's the thing, right? You can learn from the 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 bad decisions that you've made from your life experiences. And and I'll tell you this: everything that I do now, as far as my career is concerned, is all surrounded around uh, my past negative behavior, right? Um, I basically built a brand on it because, you know, I spent, you know, the majority, a good portion of my life, the majority of my life in uh, under incarceration um, through juvenile hall, juvenile placement, California Youth Authority, uh, county jails and uh, prison, right? Um, spent a lot, including the, la uh, the last term I did, you know, a full 21 years, right? However, um, I got out from that situation and, and I began to educate myself and, um, you know, I'm certified as a, um, addiction specialist. You know, I, I work as a, the manager of a substance abuse treatment program. That's also an alternative sentencing program. I also have my you know, certification in this, you know, for the anger management. I also completed the uh, certification education for uh, the domestic violence course, right? So, and that's not to brag, but the, my point is that, you know, I had a lot of issues with anger and violence and I, you know, sold drugs and, and did a lot of messed up things that harmed the community. And, and, and now, um, I understand a lot of these things in a way that the textbooks could never teach me. Right. And now I'm able to help other people who, uh, you know, are going through a similar situation. And I understand I may not be the most articulate person. Um, I may not be the, uh, even the most educated, right. As far as book knowledge is concerned. However, um, I have lived that life and I have, um, you know, for a long time suffered the consequences of living that life. So I, I, I understand the consequences. I also understand the benefits of getting it together. So um, I, I really do believe that I'm in a good position to help other people to understand um, how this actually works. And, 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 you know, it's my goal to one day to be the top of the game, the best, of course. Um, anyway. You could take reasonable precautions, but past that point, your efforts at prevention become counterproductive. You exercise no control over things that have not yet happened and trying to read others' minds so that you can know what they want from you is not going to keep you from disappointing them at times. And, and, and again, this is talking about, again, as we uh, begin to improve ourselves, a lot of us are trying to get back in good graces with our families. You know, we've burned some bridges and stuff like that. And, uh, and as we're working on ourselves, we'll try to do different things and, 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 and try to, uh, have preventative measures so that we don't, uh, cause further harm, you know, to our family or, uh, friends and loved ones and stuff like that. And, and we try to think of, okay, exactly what do I need to do? But you know, there is necessary, not necessarily an exact answer. Uh, keeping a journal, writing about your experiences may seem counterintuitive. You may wish to forget your distress and pain, but keeping a journal can help you 
realize painful emotions and see things more objectively. <clears throat> Excuse me, more objectively without attachments to feelings from the past. Writing also helps you gain insight into how your, ang your angry thoughts affect your interpretation of events and gives you control over how and when your feelings come to surface. Okay, so again, um, this writing is very important. Now, growing up, personally, this is not something that I really would have liked to do, you know, like journaling or what have you, or writing, because I absolutely did not like school. Like, I didn't like, uh, you know, going to class or doing my schoolwork and all that type of stuff. So, you know, a suggestion like this, journaling was something that was definitely would have been a turnoff for me. But I now know that doing something like journaling is very helpful. Even if you're journaling or you're writing about a situation that happened that you're trying to process um, your anger on, sometimes writing out the details and the facts are very helpful in, in helping you to understand exactly what happened. Because here's the thing. We have an idea of what happened and you're there in the situation. So you're like, OK, I was there. I know exactly what happened, but that's not always the case. Right. So, you know, like certain specific things. Right. He moved left or right and he hit you with his right hand. What have you. Right. So, you know that. OK, but we don't know the precipitating events, the precipitating situation that led up to those actions, to the provocative event. Right. We don't know um, what that person may have been going through at the time. We don't know um, if we we don't necessarily know if we uh, could have possibly did something to provoke it, because a lot of people will carry around baggage with them. And you could say certain things. And when you say it, uh, a certain word or a certain phrase or say it a certain way. Or even a certain way you may position your, you know, your body, it may be a trigger for that person, right? It may remind them of some bad situation that they had with someone else. And now when they're looking at you, it's reminding them of that situation. And so they just kind of flash on you, right? And, and so it may not be exactly, um, what you think it is, right? You don't have necessarily have all the facts. And sometimes writing it out can help you to discern um, what exactly is going on. And that is definitely helpful. And it definitely doesn't hurt when you write it down. Also writing it down is a way to sometimes get it off your chest, right? Just like there, like therapy, for example, one of the biggest benefits of going to therapy and having a therapist and, and, and talking to a therapist is just that talking to the therapist and getting things off your chest. Sometimes just being able to have someone to speak about something and, and, and being able to get it out there. Sometimes that is helpful, right? Um, but we need to process it. We don't want to just vent, right? We, we talked about venting. Okay. Um, writing also helps you gain insight into how your angry thoughts affect your interpretation of events and, gives you control over how and when your feelings come to surface as they inevitably will. When you keep your thoughts abstract, locked up in your mind, you can't evaluate how well they reflect on your actual life or yourself as you really are. But when your thoughts are right in front of you in black and white, you can begin to sort them out. So the thing is, okay, and, and for some people, that sounds crazy. Like, OK, it's in my mind. What's the difference it's in my mind on a paper? I can I still know what's in my mind, but it's different. Right. Um, you know, I've had times where I've had like business plan, for example, and, and maybe went over the business plan and, you know, mentally went over the plan of what I wanted to do, but not, didn't have necessarily write it out and came up with all the different components. Because, again, I don't like writing. Um, you know, didn't necessarily hadn't wrote, written it out. And so I'm going to, you know, before I actually write out the plan, I was going to, you know, just kind of pitch it at someone 
And as I'm talking about it, again, it's my plan. I worked it out over the past, you know, couple of weeks or what have you. And, uh, and as I'm pitching it to the person, I can hear the error, right? As I'm talking about it, which is similar to if I had written about it and then read it, and then I could have saw those errors then rather than wasting so much time and then having to go back to the drawing board, right? So writing things down, it, it helps to give us more clarity on what it is that we're trying to do. <sighs> okay, and then it gives some suggestions. Again, this is from the book, um, Anger Management, How to Take Control uh, of Your Anger, Develop Self-Control and Live a Happier Life by Bill Andrews. Um, to evaluate your angry feelings in a practical way, begin by answering these questions. What situations are you writing about? What is the worst thing about this situation? How does this situation make you feel? When else have you felt this way? Right? So evaluating and breaking things down and analyzing it, you know, using these questions is very helpful. So what situation are you writing about? So you're, you're being specific, right? So you're not just generally writing, oh, I'm pissed, I'm mad, right? You're writing about that particular thing that you're trying to process. Um, what is the worst thing about the situation? So what's the worst thing that happened? Did the person yell at you? Did they punch you? Did they shoot you or stab you or kill a friend of yours or whatever the case may be? Um, how, how does this situation make you feel. So how exactly does this make you feel? And, and, and not just angry. Right. And a lot of you like, I'm pissed off. That's why I'm writing. Right. No. So sometimes you're hurt. Sometimes you're sad. Sometimes, I mean, there's a number of different emotions that we go through because again, anger is a secondary emotion. So we want to know how does the situation actually make you feel? Uh, when else have you felt this way? So was there another time that a situation, a provocative event or what have you made you feel similar to what you are feeling due to this situation? And that's also important to know because a lot of your feelings that you may have towards this person uh, about this event could be directly associated with um, it could be directly associated with a past event. Right. So if that is the case, then we'll want to know that. But a lot of times we would not process that unless we're actually writing it out. Or let's say if you're in therapy and you're processing it with the therapist or what have you. Right. But writing it out is very therapeutic. Right. And so we want to write it out and process these things. Uh, after answering the questions, go back to the first one and repeat the process. Go through the questions until you uncover some seemingly unrelated memory or experience. The process of uncovering painful memories is like peeling an onion. It may stink and make you cry, but it's how you get to uh, get to what heals you. <laughs> like that saying, um, you can also write. Excuse me. You can also write about your anger in the form of a letter to the person who hurt or offended you at the time, uh, at the time your feelings about the situation may have been unconscious or unacceptable, uh, to you. But when you bring those feelings into your awareness and make them concrete, you can move forward as you resolve the conflict between your conscious rational mind and your conscious or unconscious emotional reactions. <laughs> And it's talking about conscious and unconscious because a lot of things that we do and a lot of reactions that we have to people are associated with our subconscious. So we're still going through things or we still hold on to things that happened in the past. And 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 it's not necessarily all, always at the surface. So it's like, um, you know, you may have suffered abuse in the past in, in one form or the other, physical, verbal, emotional, sexual, or whatever kind of abuse, but that hurts, right? And 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 one of the things about our brain, it protects us from things that that we find to be overwhelming by sometimes 
helping us to forget it or to not think about it. And so it goes to the subconscious, right? But just because it's in the subconscious does not mean that it is not affecting us at all, right? It just happens to not, we're, we're just not consciously aware of it. And then, and those things that we're not consciously aware of will be part of our shadow material. And I'll get into that a little bit um, in the next lesson. I'm not going to go deep on the shadow material because uh, it's, uh, some people think it's a kind of dangerous uh, topic, but um, I think it's important. But we're going to talk about some of the most, just the general idea of of the shadow and, deal, and and working with the shadow or doing shadow work. So we do want to understand these things that are happening in the subconscious and how they are continuing to affect us. Uh, okay, so to make the most of your writing, develop some develop some habits, set aside a regular time for writing, opening your journal as soon as you get up in the morning is good for remembering dreams as well as for planning. Writing in your journal just before you go to sleep is a good uh, for reviewing a day. Associate writing with a particular spot. That spot may be your desk, a comfortable chair, or even a public place like a park, a cafe, or the food court. Right. So wherever it is, is just want to be somewhere that you're comfortable writing and it's talking about associating it with a certain place. The reason is that you will get into a certain zone. And that's why a lot of times people will uh, recommend that you don't do work in your bedroom, for example, because. You know, you want to uh, have like a certain mood, like when you walk into a certain place, you go to work, you want to be in work mode. You get in your bedroom, you want to be in bed mode, you know, for all the activities that you do in your bedroom. Right. <laughs> uh, but you want it to be a bedroom and not uh, a workspace or an office. So um, then um, then it says. Uh, OK, use props uh, such as a favorite pen or special notebook. Right. So you may find or it'd be a good idea to find a specific like tablet or notebook that you decide to use uh, to to journal about your um, anger and, and other situations. Right. And, and, and that way you're not mixing it in with some other tablet that you got to figure out what pages you're writing. And then you can go back and look at your thoughts. But one of the things I was thinking as I was uh, reading the last paragraph was the fact that if if you are in substance abuse recovery. Right. And one of the reasons I keep mentioning uh, substance abuse recovery. One, I work in substance abuse recovery uh, as a counselor and I'm general manager of a substance abuse program, but that's not the reason. The reason is that a lot of people who suffer from anger management issues also have a substance abuse issue, right? Um, and a lot of times the substance abuse issue is directly associated with whatever's going on with the anger, right? And the, and the, and the substance abuse ends up being the person's attempt to self-medicate to uh, to uh, help them to manage, you know, their different feelings and behaviors and stuff like that by self-medicating. And sometimes it might even be uh, you may even be using uh, medication that's prescribed by uh, a, uh, a doctor. Right. Um, but in anyway, in substance abuse recovery, it there's a idea in the 12 steps about you know, doing like a daily inventory, right? You know, you do an inventory in the morning when you wake up to getting ready, preparing for your day, and you will do an inventory at nighttime um, at the end of your day, right? Going over all of the things that you've done, seeing if there's, you know, the things that you've done right, um, seeing if there's anything that you need to correct or even anybody that you should make amends to and such, right? So it, it's like a good idea and it kind of keeps you focused and helps to keep you on track. Right. So. Uh, so uh, the next thing it says, it says um, when you write what's on your what's on your mind and in your heart, you affirm not only your ability to manage your anger, but also the validity of your feelings. You confirm your sense of self and give legitimacy to your existence as yourself, not as a son, brother husband, friend, or employee in the real world, in real time, 
not in your dreams, your imagination or your fantasies or your fantasies. So again, you confirm your sense of self and give legitimacy to your existence as yourself, right? Because, and, and one of the reasons this is important is because we all have different identities and we have, we have different roles we play, right? So when you're with your friends and associates that you possibly hang out with on the streets, you will have um, certain uh, ways that you conduct yourself when you're hanging out with your friends and associates. You will have different ways that you conduct yourself when you are with your family and loved ones and uh, and, and when you're at work, right, you'll have another role. And in each one of these roles, you know, there's like a different you. I mean, you're still going to be yourself, but there's a different way that you're going to act and respond. And it, and it should be so, right? I mean, there's, I don't treat my mother. I don't act in front of my mother the way I would necessarily act around my friends and associates who are uh, my age and we do different things, right? I'm going to have a different level of respect. Um, for my mother than I do for the average uh, individual. So um, we're going to have these different roles, but here it's pointing out the fact that we are um, accepting ourselves as we are, right? Our image and our legitimacy as a human being, as ourselves, and not as something um, that's connected with someone else. So uh, you're in control, acting, uh, not reacting, right? And and again, they say acting and not reacting. And a lot of times, I'll use a uh, respond rather than react, right? And and what it's saying when it's saying acting and not reacting, you're making a conscious, reasonable decision to do the things that you're doing, and you're not just reacting to some stimuli or some you know provocative act that someone has. Uh, done to you because what happens when we do most of the times we end up getting in trouble because we're we, we we're not clearly uh, thinking about the situation, um, uh, you know, and and our actions are what we're doing about the situation. So that is important. Um, anyway, uh, I'm actually gonna uh, get into. I got some other stuff that I want to take. Um, you into, and we will get into that uh, in the next lesson um, as this video uh, is long enough. And again, you will have uh, uh, things in writing as with each video, you will have uh, some written material on the website that you will be able to read and uh, you will be able to watch the video or you can do either or read or uh, watch the video. Either way, you would still be able to answer the questions uh, that's associated with each lesson. And, um, that's all for now.